Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Pop Culture University, the university where you learn everything going on in the world of pop culture and see what life lessons you can get from it, what we can learn from it, what is there to extract from these wild celebrities living their lives, because it's not just pop culture, it's our culture, and they're not just celebrities, they're you and me. Thank you so much for joining me again today, students. If it's your first time here, take a seat in the classroom wherever you would like. If it's not your first time here, thank you so much for coming back. I love you. I stand you. I'm in your fandom. You guys, there's so much to talk about today. I'm actually so excited for this episode. We have some of my faves that I'm talking about and some of my least faves. There's a great conspiracy theory at the end with a, a huge array of celebrities. And it's going to answer questions about why celebrities cannot grow up and act their age and um, just, just not be a grown, mature human being sometimes. That conspiracy theory is going to be incredible. But we need to talk about Selena Gomez. Kylie Jenner, Timothy Chalamet at the Golden Globes, the flopped Taylor Swift jokes at the Golden Globes, Ariana Grande New Music, DDG and Halle finally confirming that they just had a son. So many pop stars on Ozempic. All the tea is getting spilled today. And I just want to say, if you are not prepared to really get into the real tea, have a nuanced analytical conversation where everything is not just slay queen, puppies and rainbows, maybe this podcast is not for you because we're really gonna get into the real shit today. So before we begin, make sure to rate this podcast five star, like it on YouTube. We just hit 4,000 reviews on Spotify. Fuck yeah, so thank you all my students, I love you. And yeah, let's get into Pop Culture University. Take your seats. You guys, thank fuck, pop music is going to be saved. The goddess, God is a woman herself has risen from the dead on the third day and is coming back for her new lead single, Ariana Grande is back with new music. Thank God. I feel like I forgot what good pop music was even about. I forgot what pop was even supposed to be. Fun, um, undeniably incredible, undeniably iconic, and just a complete serve. And no one does a complete serve quite like Ariana Grande. So I'm sorry to all the pop girlies, Tate McRae, Sabrina Carpenter, she gave you girls three years, now your time is up. And now she's coming back with her new single, Yes And. I'm so fucking excited because Yes And can mean a lot of different things, especially because she's just gone through such a tumultuous time in her life. 2023, as we said, was a horrible combination of just deranged factors that were trying to bring her down. But the crucible of that year, I think, is going to make 2024 her year. And yes, and is going to be the comeback that everyone will be paying attention to. But like, OK, so I have two ideas of what I think the song is going to be about. Max Martin produced it. It is rumored to be interpolating Vogue by Madonna. And only Madonna would let Ariana Grande sample Vogue. She would or like what I meant to say is Madonna would only let Ariana Grande sample Vogue because Madonna loves her. She really sees Ariana as one of the women singers today carrying on Madonna's torch. So there's a lot on her back here. Max Martin produced Anna Vogue interpolation. I think my first theory about what Yes And will be is that people are going to think it's going to be a sassy clapback. Like, yes, I stole your man. And yes, you're still a fan. And and there's that really iconic clip of her on the red carpet at the Billboard Music Awards where she's like flailing around her high pony with her high pony wiles, like seducing the Getty image photographers. And one of them is screaming about her ponytails in her face or can you look over here? You're in the way. And she's like, yes. And what about it? It is in the way, bitch. So people just think it's going to be her being very sassy. Yes. And I did all this and you still love me and you're eating up my content today. But I want to say if you shitted on Ariana, if you were so quick to join the hate mob and the anti-feminist propaganda against her. I don't want you to enjoy Yes And. Back off. We all know I have been really practicing my gaslighting here, trying to get everyone back on Ariana Grande's side, which I'm still doing. So if you don't love her and you did not support her, please do not stream this Friday. My second idea of what I think this song is going to be, and this is what I really think the song is going to be about. Yes, I think it could be this come back very uh, fortified, irreverent statement about, I don't give a fuck what you guys think about me. But what I really think Yes And is going to be, is it's going to be a sexual 
ass song. We all know Ariana Grande loves to make her bops about 34, 35, 69 it, getting railed all night so hard that I can't even walk the next day like this pussy is designed for you. She is the cupcake of pop stars. She is so vulgar and explicit. So I think Yes And is going to be a song about improv in the bedroom because Yes And is the iconic improvisational phrase. What I've never done improv, but I think what you learn in improv class is to keep the impromptu conversation going and make sure it doesn't die and that it's entertaining. You have to respond with yes to what the person said and, and continue on the conversation. So I think that's going to be the vibe of like, um, I actually wrote what I think it might be. So I feel like these might be some lyrics from the song and this is going to be my parody for the day. I feel like she could say like, we're improv tonight. Is our chemistry just right? Improv with me, I'll follow your lead. And then it will say something like, he said, can I take off your dress? Yes, and can I kiss you on the neck? Yes, and can I go where no one goes? Yes, and can I give it to you nice and slow? Yes, and I feel like it's just going to be like seeing how like a sexual night unfolds with someone where they're improving in the bed and always saying yes, and. So yeah, I'm very excited. But if this goes bad, she's going to be fucked because people will want to jump on her and just hound on her for the bad reputation she already has. So there is a lot of weight on this, and I don't want to give people the satisfaction of it being a bad song, but I don't think it's going to be. All of her lead singles in the past have debuted in the top 10 and have been massive hits. She's actually the only artist to ever have every single lead single be a top 10 hit, ever. So big shoes to fill with her dainty feet. You know who else is releasing that day? Lil Nas X. So Lil Nas X, you may not think as really qualified or intimidating competition for Ariana Grande, but he really comes through when it comes to massive viral moments and massive streaming numbers. He is definitely one of the people who like to manipulate the charts and weaponize social media to maybe get a not very genuine, very reflective, accurate showing on the charts. He will inflate his numbers in certain ways. So I think he is some competition for Ariana Grande this weekend. She's definitely going to pull out with the number one in the end in my book and in my opinion. But Lil Nas X, he's already back up to his gimmicky ways. So we all remember his, in my opinion, iconic scene of him pole dancing down to hell to give the devil a lap dance and be the bottom that he is. I thought that was fierce, sexy, show-stopping, and actually very valid. There's all these artists these days who are trying to play into the Lil Nas X-esque I am the devil imagery to try to be deep or pretend like their music has some very strong artsy statement, but it doesn't. Like Doja Cat's really did not. She's just, mm, I'm the devil, I'm a bad little bitch, I'm a rebel. And Sam Smith and Kim Petras just dressing as the devil in Unholy. But Lil Nas X to me is the only one who truly had a statement because obviously all the homophobes told him that he's going to hell for coming out as gay. So he was like, okay, well, I'm gonna go to hell and give the devil a lap dance. That's fierce, I love that. That wasn't a gimmick to me, but it did come off gimmicky to the public. Now he's doing another gimmick on the same, the, the different side of the same gimmick coin. And this single, it's called J. Christ, I believe. Something about J. Christ and, oh my God, wait, like Jesus Christ, like J. Cole, but J. Christ, that's crazy. <laughs> but the gimmick is that he is now saying he's a Christian singer. And the promo for it was him being crucified on the cross. Apparently, this is with Kesha as well. I know she has some holy moments after she put the bottle of Jack that she used to brush her teeth back on the shelf. She has some holy songs coming out these days. I love both of them, but I feel like people are not going to buy their Christian music vibe. It makes me sad for Lil Nas X because he is seen as a gimmick, but I think he's better than a gimmick. 
he's seen as not an albums artist, but in my mind, like he is an albums artist and he just needs to believe in himself more and stop relying on these social media campaigns that make him come off as kind of a joke because it is getting old at this point. He like people don't see him as someone who truly has an amazing pen game and has world changing lyrics. They just see him as some sort of Gen Z chronically online social media master marketer. And that's a great skill to have, but after a while it becomes very obvious. It's it makes me sad he put himself in this box though because in one of his songs he says um, it's called One of Me on his last album, and it's all about how he feels like the world just sees him as a gimmick and a joke, and he doesn't like that. The lyrics go, use a meme, use a joke, been a gimmick from the go, all the things that you do just to get your face to show. Oh, you think you're big shit, big pimp and let me know, ain't the next big thing, you're the next thing to go. Now can you prove yourself, everybody waiting? I'm just being real, swear somebody hating. I don't see you lasting long, and that's just me being honest. Even if your album's okay, it's flopping. That's a promise. And that's how he feels like the world doesn't take him seriously. In presenting that fear to everyone, he kind of put himself right back in that box, but with what he's doing now. It just kind of sucks that he did that to himself. But we'll see how it goes. I'm excited for the song regardless. The biggest thing I was confused about, actually, is the song is not a Christian song at all. It's very much so like a fun party dance rap song. Maybe there's a line about God or whatever, but it's definitely not a Christian song. So I don't think this will go over well for him and people are gonna be mad. Can I tell you about a really horrible experience I had this weekend? I went to a birthday party that I was invited to. This was like my first night back to LA after going home for the holidays for two weeks, which was an amazing time. I didn't realize how soul sucking LA could be sometimes. Being home, just put my feet back on the ground, prove to myself that LA did not take my soul. And the second I get back, I go to a birthday party for my friend, bunch of people I've never met there. They may be big in this world, have some sway, followers, power. I don't know them, but that's great for them. But I go up to one of them, just super casual conversation. Cruel Summer started playing at the party, so I go, yay, I love Taylor. And he goes, something about, but Beyonce's better. Are you a fan of the Renaissance? And I'm like, of course. I went to the Renaissance tour, one of the best nights of my fucking life. I love them both. And he goes, but Renaissance is better. And I'm like, okay, maybe. I think I personally am more passionate about the Eras tour. And then he looks at me and decides what I just said is worthy of some sort of insult. And he goes, I can tell you're a Taylor Swift fan because of how your hair looks. And I'm like, oh, wow. Damn. So he was so offended that I like Taylor Swift more that he basically just said my hair looks like shit, which he's right. Like, it does. And that's why I'm going to get my hair transplant. But it's just strange that he was so emboldened by a stupid ass conversation within 30 seconds of meeting. That was a totally simmered, calm exchange we were having. And then he just felt so empowered as a member of the Beehive to shit on my appearance, to basically put me down, say he's more slay queen, more cunty as me. And I'm only saying this to give you a grasp of the situation. This man was objectively ugly. I'm sorry, he just was. And he's saying that to me. I just thought that was insane. Um, and I know Beyonce has lyrics about like, she looks a mess, or I look better than her. Just There's these fun lyrics about like being more cunty than someone, being more slay queen, but I don't think she actually wants her fans to be a huge cunt. So I was extremely upset with him. Um, definitely walked away from that exchange very quickly and then not talk to him the rest of the night. But yeah, I'm getting a hair transplant because you know he said my hair's ugly, so can't wait to get my hair transplant. I made my consultation for March. And this doctor is so good. I've been stalking him on social media for a long time. He's on so many doctory list of best hair transplant surgeons in America. And he happens to live 20 minutes away from me. I'm not gonna say his name now. I don't know if we'll be able to work together depending on how long I'll need a appointment for or if he thinks I'm not a good candidate or maybe he'll recommend me to someone else. I am getting consultations with others, but I really do have my eyes on this doctor and hopefully 
we will be able to come up with a plan. But I'm so fucking excited. Hair transplanting is like an art. It's not just about you need someone to complete the task. A lot of people tell me, just go to Turkey. It's so cheap. All the influencers go there. And they're right. A lot of the David Dobrik squad have gone to Turkey to get their hair transplants and just the fuck boys online who want to keep their youthful 17 year old hairline forever because that's their brand. I get it. And Turkey is great with really filling your hairline with hair. I'm getting into all the science behind hair transplants now, but you have all these grafts in the back of your head, but you only have so many. And people think Turkey's the best option because they just take all your grafts and shove them to the front of your hairline. But what people will realize five, 10 years after is that the transplant hair isn't permanent and you need to be conservative. So you should really go to a doctor that is conservative with the amount of grafts they take and do it in a really artsy way. So they make the most of how much of your donor hair they take right off the bat. That's why I'm not going to Turkey. It will be very expensive in Beverly Hills, probably like ten to $15,000. And I'm getting on the lower end of donor hairs, but it'll be worth it. As you guys know, that was my New Year's resolution in 2024 to finally get this done. So I'm not going to wait any longer. Hopefully I can get it by my birthday in August. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about here is that Hallie motherfucking Bailey and DDG have confirmed their parents, they had a son after the least convincing cover-up job of all time, the worst reveal of all time. Everyone pretended to be shocked. No one moved. They had a son. They named him Halo. I'm obsessed with that name. It's so celebrity. It's so on brand as the Beyonce protege that she is. And if, you know, if they're at the grocery store one day and Halo runs off and gets lost, she can just scream, Halo, Halo, in a very beautiful Beyonce-esque way to find him again. That's what I think when these celebrities name their kids these powerful names. Didn't Nick Cannon name one of his kids Powerful Queen? I literally think the name is Powerful Queen. And I love that. Or Trisha Paytas's Malibu Barbie. How are you going to discipline someone with such a powerful name? Like, screaming their name at them is a compliment. Is Rob Kardashian just going to scream upstairs, Dream Kardashian, get your ass down here? Or Powerful Queen, get your ass down here? The names are just too powerful for their own good. But Halo is definitely another one of these iconic celebrity names. Hallie was very sassy when she announced the pregnancy as well because her caption at the end of it said, welcome to the world, my beautiful baby boy, blah, blah, blah. The world was desperate to know you. Wow, the shade, the sass. She said, are you thirsty hoes happy? You can finally know that I was indeed pregnant the whole time, even though it was very obvious. And of course, as your fans, we're going to be curious about what's going on. I hate when celebrities like refute the buzz that they made and try to act like they weren't stirring up all this conversation themselves. Not to say that she shouldn't have gone outside the whole time she was pregnant, like Kylie Jenner, but girl, of course we're going to know. And it's nice retrospectively to look at the photos where we're not sure if she's pregnant or if she's actually hiding a bump and being like, okay, she was nine months pregnant there, eight months pregnant there. So I like all that, that, you know, all of our questions were answered. And I think she just covered it up the whole time because she just didn't want to talk about it. This year, she had so many projects like The Little Mermaid and The Color Purple, her first debut single coming out. It already came out. It got nominated for a Grammy. And in the song, she actually said her son's name. And we didn't even realize. She says the lyrics, heaven wears your halo. Darling, they know you're an angel. I love that. It was like a love letter to her unborn son. It all makes sense now. So good for them. And I hope Chloe Bailey was in the delivery room screaming at her and holding her hand while she pushes. And she was like, push fucking harder. (laughs) I feel like if anyone can inspire you to push a baby out of your cooch, it is Chloe Bailey for sure. Chloe Bailey's going to be the best aunt. I wish she was my godmother. 
I'm so obsessed with her. I can't express to you enough how much of a fan I am of Chloe and Hallie. I've been following them so hard since their album came out in 2020. Someone who people are is not a fan of, though, someone everyone kind of hates, is DDG, unfortunately. You guys know my beef with DDG. I'm going to now, now that we know they have a kid together, I'm going to brainwash myself into being a DDG fan. I'm going to love him, or at least try to love him. Because at the end of the day, Hallie is a smart woman. She knows exactly what she's doing in choosing her partner. And this is her life, her choices. I'm happy for her, and I'm here to support so while I may not love DDG, I will like him now. Maybe when he threatened to ruin her career on Twitter, I didn't love that. <laughs> but I'll try to love him now. When the announcement came out, um, a lot of negative tweets were sent out about DDG. Some saying, Hallie being pregnant the entire time while he was on here beefing with her co-star on a burner account just makes the entire situation 10 times more embarrassing than it already was. This one says, congratulations to Hallie and the baby. Not DDG. And then DDG is a YouTuber, which, you know, I can't say anything about because here I am. But someone tweeted, these are going to be his new YouTube titles. I forgot to feed the baby. Hallie curses me out and cries. Left the baby at my cousin's house. Rock Nation calls me. <laughs> baby watching his first movie. Gets mad it's not the mermaid film. And they're so fucking right <laughs> about all of those, which is why I can't even comment on them. And I I actually think those, those people saw into the future. He's going to use those titles. Whatever, man. Um, he already made a video about the baby being born. He filmed inside the delivery room. So I'm like, okay, Hallie. Your man is definitely very eager to capitalize on all of this. She might be down for the YouTuber life, though. She may think it's fun. Maybe they'll do a family channel. My headphones are still left in DDG's stepdad's car, though. He was my Uber last month. I left my beats in there because I have ADHD and forget everything. I've called him multiple times, and he does not want to give them back. So I actually don't have those headphones. And DDG, if you're seeing this, I would love to get them back. Please. All right, everyone, the Golden Globes happen this weekend. If you aren't aware of how important the Golden Globes are, I would put them somewhere between an Emmy and an Oscar in terms of how much clout you will get from winning a Golden Globe. It's quite prestigious, but not the most prestigious award. And it combines both of the elements of those award shows of television and film. So it's like the best of both worlds. Like when you take an upper and a downer at the same time. <laughs> there were a lot of... Fun winners, Billie Eilish won for What Was I Made For, for the Barbie soundtrack. Best original song. She beat out some pretty heavy hitters on there. That song is giving her such a massive year. She's only put out that, but it, you would think she dropped a whole fucking album because that song is winning everything. It's at, She's at every award show. She's doing all the press for it, all the performances, and I couldn't be happier. I think I would rate that in the top three songs of 2023, now retrospectively looking back. It was truly omnipresent on the radio, in the movies. She's everywhere with that song, as she deserves. She really put all the Billie Eilish magic that only she can bring. And it came on at an event I was at the other day, and everyone was like, skip this song before we all kill ourselves. Because it's the saddest thing, but you like can't help to want to indulge in the sadness of the song and just stare out your window and cry. It's so perfect. Um, Taylor Swift was there. She lost her award. She lost it to Barbie. It was for a cinematic box office achievement or something. Basically, what blonde icon made America the most money this year award? The blonde billionaire award. Unfortunately, went to Margot Robbie instead of Taylor Swift. I think that award was actually invented this year just to get them both to arrive, which is what award shows always do. That's very the VMAs of them. The VMAs will always invent some stupid award to make sure everyone gets an award. Like their Song for Good award that they just hand out to literally anyone every year. So good for the Golden Globes. Their viewership went up 50%. 
And it's definitely because Taylor Swift was there. Duh. And Margot, the atomic blondes. Speaking of atomic bombs, Oppenheimer won for best motion picture for a drama. They are really pushing that film so hard. I guess I didn't see it, it coming where Oppenheimer was going to outslay Barbie at all these award shows. Barbie isn't even going to be eligible for best picture at the Oscars because they're saying it was some sort of adaptation of previous material because there was a doll based on it. But obviously that's not true. It's not an adaptation. People are trying to like overthrow that. They're about to grab their pitch, their pitchforks and run right into the battlefield to defend Barbie and get it to be nominated for an Oscar. But yeah, Oppenheimer was doing great. Everyone was fangirling over Killian Murphy. Am I pronouncing that right? I, I, I don't know. He's the guy who played the main character in Oppenheimer. He's an Irish lad. I do think he's very sexy, very attractive. And usually I'm not into Irish lads like that. I like someone who looks different than me. People, I, I got one comment before in my TikTok comments that said I looked like him and I was honored. I ran with it because he does have really amazing ocean blue eyes and the clearest, most amazing skin I've ever seen a 47 year old man have. Sometimes baby girl is a 47 year old man. Barry Keegan, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He, he's from Saltburn the man who schmurdered everyone in Saltburn. He did not win any awards last night, but people were thirsting over him too. And he's another Irish man. So here I am, finally, I feel like Irish men, Irish men were never overlooked, but I would say they were just cast into the, into the herd of the European boring basic mutts that no one really cared about or thought were cute. Just the most boring, like blending in, People, so I'm happy these Irish men are getting the representation <laughs> for being sexy for the first time. No one really saw them as sexy before. I love it. And I have like, the most Irish fucking name in the world. So definitely representing the Irish lads here like the St. Patty I am. Best motion picture for a musical or comedy went to Emma Starn. Emma Starn. I love driving on Sunset because there's massive billboards everywhere. And right now there's a massive billboard of Emma Stone and a massive billboard of Killian Murphy for Oppenheimer. I feel like they're really going to duke it out for Best Picture at the Oscars. Those two. I haven't seen either of them. I need to see Poor Things, though, with Emma Stone in it because she she won Best Actress as well. So I really want to see that. So there were good awards, whatever. But... One of the highlights, or the lowlights, I would say, but what's getting picked apart on Twitter is Joe Coy's opening monologue. I only knew Joe Coy, the comedian, prior because he dated Chelsea Handler, who I cannot get enough of. Her comedy to me is amazing. I'm obsessed with her. I used to watch Chelsea lately in my living room when I was like eight years old, and my parents would come home, scream at me to turn that shit off and spray me with a bottle of holy water. I'm kidding. They wouldn't do that. But <laughs> I have vivid memories of my dad being like, turn that off. He loves Chelsea Handler too, though. So that's how why he knew how inappropriate it was. They were like dating last year and Joe Coy would like not. I don't know. I don't think he wanted to like continue on the relationship. That's what the vibe to me was his loss because Chelsea Handler is the biggest icon in the whole world. But he had multiple jokes that bombed. An even b bigger bomb than the atomic bomb was the Taylor Swift joke that he made about the NFL. Obviously, if Taylor Swift is in the crowd, we're going to have to capitalize her and say some stuff about her. So the, all the rabid Swifties at home who are watching just for her get their screen time with Blondie. So he made a joke that said, what's the difference between the NFL and the Golden Globes? The Golden Globes have less cutaway shots of Taylor Swift than the NFL. No one laughed. No one moved. They were waiting for the punchline, and it never came. Unfortunately, the joke was on Joe Coy. And the real difference between the NFL and the Golden Globes is that people in the NFL wouldn't have dropped the ball like you did. There's less fumbles in the NFL than the amount of fumbles he made in that monologue. Even all the older, so 
over it. Actors in the crowd who are like 80 years old were like, that was the worst joke I've ever seen in my whole life. Taylor didn't even pretend it was funny. She just sipped her wine, adding to the illustrious catalog of Taylor Swift drunk at award shows <laughs> memes. I'm so happy we have a new installment of that. So at least we got that. But I think past Taylor would have just made him feel good and laughed at it. But she's not about making men feel comfortable these days. So I'm glad she let the slight embarrassment of that really sink in. Another bad joke he made was about Barbie. And he was saying Barbie is about a plastic doll with big fake boobs. And when he got to that. He just, he started the joke with that. And I was like, wow, okay, this is really the, the direction he's going with the Barbie joke. And then he finished by saying, and then at some point in the film, she gets flat feet, she gets cellulite, something about looking like frumpy or unsightly. And in Hollywood, we call girls who look like that character actors. Everyone in the crowd, bombastic side eye, shaking their heads in their hands. So, Lena Gomez like bent down on her table, unable to fathom it. Even Meryl Streep was like, what the actual fuck? And it's it's so like audacious of him to say that because the whole point of Barbie was the antithesis of that, to not judge or put down women in that exact context, which he just did, so... I think we should cut all men's mics this year, including mine. I think you should take this mic away from me right now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But yeah, he really flopped. There was one funny joke about Barry Keegan's penis that I enjoyed. He was like, where's Barry tonight? Where is he seated? Pointed over there to where he was. And then he goes, okay, where's Barry's penis seated? Because it's big. It's big, huh? And that made me laugh. Like I said, we're we're both Irish lads, so... <laughs> Joking, but the main drama at the Golden Globes was between Selena Gomez, as always. I mean, come on now. We're entering the segment of the show called Shit Talking Selena Gomez. But what I will say is I'm really trying to love her this year. The vibe for Pop Culture University is loving everyone in 2024. And the undertone of everything I say is always these celebrities are my best friends who I'm being a little critical and constructive of. Because as a best friend, you always want to be real with your bestie and... Um, Give them a loving dose of honesty and con constructiveness. So that is the route I'm going to take with Selena. And what I will say about Selena and her scrappy spirit that has been going on for years and years and years and years at this point, her delusion I first I thought was just a reflection of like her being a little out of touch with reality and clearly having a victim complex and bullying people. But the fact that she's still going with this just just like like character actor that she is playing and just being so messy everywhere she goes and dominating the headlines it's actually starting to get to the point of high camp and I'm like damn she's scrappy so good for Selena Gomez uh, when she ran oh, okay so this is what happened at the Golden Globes there was a commercial break and whoever decided it was a good idea to have cameras rolling on the Golden Globes website during the commercial break to see what all the celebrities were up to god bless you you are the MV motherfucking P. We got so much good content from that. Give that gay Gen Z intern a raise because they deserve it. So we see Selena Gomez run over to Taylor Swift and immediately at the commercial break, like pounce on her and like whisper in her ear some major drama that just happened. And you can tell it just happened because she is coming fresh off of the acceleration of just having like a gag worthy moment happen to her she ran to taylor swift whispered in her ear and we just see taylor swift react in the most shocked like <gasps> bereft way as if she just got piping hot tea she loved everything she was saying there was a third girl at the table talking shit with them kelly Teller, Miles Teller's wife. She's gorgeous. She's beautiful. The three of them gossiping together, that's going to be an iconic photo for sure. Like these three iconic, well, I mean, Kelly, just for the sake of the moment, we're going to say these three beautiful, famous women gossiping together and looking so elegant and successful about to be awarded some great accolade, but m they're more focused on the drama. It's going to be an iconic photo in black and white one day in like a hundred years that we'll look back on. Like, 
Marilyn Monroe at the Golden Globes. I still remember the iconic photos of her. That's going to be the photo we look back on. And I just think it really was an iconic moment when she ran over to her and whispered the drama into her ear. And then we think what the lip readers were going viral for uh, decoding what they were talking about. It seemed like Selena Gomez said, I wanted to take a photo with him. And he said, no. So she wanted to take a photo with someone, but someone that man was with, a woman said no. Then we see Kelly mouth with Timothy. Selena nods, yep. And Taylor's just oh, offended, appalled, gobsmacked, bereft. She cannot believe the audacity of Kylie Jenner to potentially not let Selena Gomez take a photo with her man, Timothy. Now, if you pan to the other Big Brother-esque camera at the Golden Globes commercial, we see Kylie Jenner and Timothy just loving all up on each other. So in love. They think they're the only people in the room. They think they're the lady and the tramp on some romantic day pulling the spaghetti together with their mouths. Like, they were so in love that it was actually the most convincing celebrity relationship I've seen in a long time. It's either they're really dating, like we all weren't sure of, or they're going to both win Best Actor for a limited time PR relationship, which I could see them winning as well. But either way, they were so cuddled up to each other that they didn't see anyone else in the room. So what people think happened is Selena wanted to take a photo with Timothy. Now, my first thought there is, of course, Selena wants to stir some drama up. She was taking photos with everyone in the room, so she saw an opportunity to be messy and wanted to take one with Timothy, pull him away from Kylie for a second. Why would that be a big idea, like a big deal, though? Because Selena and Timothy used to be very intense love interest in a movie that they played together called A Rainy Day in New York just a few years ago in 2019. I guess at this point, that was like half a decade ago, so not just a few years ago. But they were making out this whole movie, loving up on each other. Maybe she caught chlamydia from him like everyone else did. I'm kidding. Love you, Timmy. But anyway, they definitely have some history there. They're very good friends. And we know the drama between Selena and Kylie. That would obviously give Kylie the reason to not want her to have this reuniting moment with Timothy. All of this drama was confirmed, though, when the Hollywood Reporter put out two accounts to confirm it. One with a video of... Kelly Teller yelling with Timothy to Selena Gomez's face so loud and then getting whiplash and gasping so intensely that you would ha you would know that it's a Kardashian level drama that they're talking about. It's a continuation of the Mean Girls drama from last year because the tea was that fucking good that she gassed back to Mars. And the Hollywood Reporter put out a source from a witness as if this is some world-changing crime that they saw go down. A source from a witness that heard what the conversation was about, allegedly, and it was about Kylie and Timothy. So what I feel about this situation, students, as I said, I'm trying to love everyone here. I will say it seems valid that Selena Gomez wanted to take a photo with Timothy because anyone I kiss, even in a movie, I would catch feelings for and need to be friends with forever <laughs> and never be able to fully let them go or say goodbye. So, of course, if I saw them at the Golden Globes, I would want to take a photo with them. They're friends. But that's what Selena Gomez does. She masquerades her bad intentions with the obvious, presumable good intention that you think she might have. But I think beneath there, she was like, hmm, I have a good reason to go interrupt them. We were friends. Let's try to do that. And I think Selena Gomez is absolutely in the wrong because why would she go up to a woman who she got in a huge cyber bullying back and forth with fiasco last year to try to take a picture with her boyfriend? That's insane. So I think Kylie was in the right to want to keep her distance from Selena and just say, no, I'm sorry, you're not going to take a photo with my man. So again, I'm going to give the superlative this week here at Pop Culture University for Secret Villain of the Week to Selena Gomez. But Selena, I am starting to really appreciate the drama you give to us. As Selena does, she tries to backtrack and put back on the mask of innocent victimhood girl. So she goes to People Magazine with her direct representatives and said, 
Selena was absolutely not referencing anything about Timothy or Kylie. Never even spoke to or saw them. She definitely saw them. The room was not that big. And they were quite the spectacle making out there. <clears throat> and Kelly Teller made a very rookie move of screaming Timothy's name. So I'm sorry, but I'm not going to believe that of what Selena said, as I think she has a track record of not being the most believable. And then Selena goes, of course, this is where she thrives. Her natural habitat is the comment section of random Instagram post. She comments on an E! News post about the drama and she goes, no, I told Taylor about two of my friends who hooked up. Not that that's anyone's business. <laughs> I love that she has to mask that whole petty situation of her shit talking with another petty situation of her shit talking just with two people that apparently just about two people that we don't know. She's actually kind of hilarious. It's just so camp that this 31 or two year old girl gets up at the commercial break at the Golden Globes while they're honoring the most respected, um, like just, yeah, the most respected movies and TV shows of the year. She can't focus on that. She has to run to her bestie to just spill the tea about some personal stuff going on in her life. She's actually kind of hilarious for that. And I kind of appreciate her. Um, Timothy Chalamet, he was out and about in LA, not far from here, because I could kind of like recognize the area he was in. He was in a paparazzi video and he commented on the situation. The paparazzi said, would you deny Selena a photo? He said, no. The paparazzi goes, so everything's good? And he's like, yes. Very annoyed. Very sheepishly answering these questions very quietly. He's not trying to make a scene. And this paparazzi is like hounding him down. And then he goes, do Kylie and Selena have beef? And Timothy's laughing almost as if per perplexed. And he's like, no. So he probably doesn't know. But the gag is that the prop that he, Timothy asked the paparazzi, why, like, how'd you even find me? Why were you standing here waiting outside of this building that I was in? And the paparazzi goes, I was waiting for DDG, not you. <laughs> I'm like, no way. DDG probably called the paparazzi on himself, but she found Timothy Chalamet instead. I love that. Selena ended the night as she always does with a deranged, confident social media post of her like pushing bed, uh, of her pushing Benny Blanco up against a wall and French kissing him. And the caption is, I won. <laughs> I'm so impressed with her commitment to the bit, honestly. She's not America's sweetheart. She's like America's ho like hormonal teenage girl. Good for her, Selena. You didn't win the Golden Globe for only murders in the building. And since Gypsy Rose wasn't there, you were the only murder in the building. So good for you. All right, you guys. There's a pressing issue in 2024 that I think it's only going to get progressively worse and worse. And that's Ozempic. And I want to say Ozempic will be a beautiful thing, but also a very maybe hurtful thing to some people. And this conversation, trigger warning for people who are sensitive to topics of body image and body positivity, things of that nature, because we're really going to look at both sides of the coin and have a nuanced discussion about it. But there's a lot of pop girlies on Ozempic right now. Very shamelessly, I might add. Very obviously. Which we love. We love that for them. And I know everyone's like, don't talk about people's bodies. Don't say anything about their bodies. And I would love the simplicity of a world like that. But I think when there is such a insane dr like drastic change in someone's image whose whole brand prior to the change was body positivity we shouldn't discuss their body but we should discuss maybe the message that they're sending I truly think everyone is beautiful at every size body positivity to me is all about loving yourself 
no matter what you look like, well, you're still getting yourself to a healthy place. And it's, it's just not being hard on yourself for having fluctuations or being in a place where you may not be super thrilled about right now. It's about loving yourself on every step of that journey, but it's also definitely about being healthy as well. So Kelly Clarkson, which I know people don't play about. We all love Kelly Clarkson so much. And I do too. I think she's the quintessential relatable celebrity. She's one of the most hardest working women in Hollywood. She lost 60 pounds this year. Applaud. I love that. Good for her. She talked about it in a People cover story. So she's letting the world know. She told us the way she lost 60 pounds since the summer, so only like six months, is her move to New York. She said, walking in the city is quite the workout. Okay, interesting. She says, I'm really into infrared saunas right now, and I just got a cold plunge because everyone wore me down. This is giving... Very similar to what Kim Kardashian said when she lost 16 pounds in three weeks. She was like, I wear sauna suits and I am constantly moving and eating vegetables. Kelly Clarkson then said, I eat a healthy mix. I dropped weight because I've been listening to my doctor. A couple of years, I didn't listen to her doctor. 90% of the time, I'm really good at it because a protein diet is good for me anyway. I'm a Texas girl, so I like meat. Sorry, vegetarians in the world. Yeah, that is the most fill-in-the-blank PR answer that her publicist probably told her to say that a lot of people's publicists will tell them to say when they're on Ozempic. Just say, you eat vegetables, you walk, you wear a, a, like a sauna suit. Like You have to throw in some sort of curveball about how you lost the weight. You can't just be like, I walked and ate vegetables because no one would believe that. You have to throw in some other mechanism that isn't common. So she's like, I wore a sauna suit thinking that that's a miracle worker or something. Now people are trying to do what Kelly Clarkson did, and there's scams online. So this is a warning to all my students here. There's scams online trying to sell you gummies that Kelly Clarkson ate to lose weight. And I actually saw them as I was researching this episode before I saw the article about how it's a scam. And it's just promising that if you eat these gummies, you'll lose weight just as fast as her. And then people were leaving comments on our Instagram that I was also stalking to prepare for this. And multiple comments said, I ordered the gummies you promoted. I thought I was paying $39.99 and I got charged $200. And I think right there is a quintessential example of why I just think more honesty about Ozempic needs to be a thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a great thing. But you don't want to mislead your, your following when you have such an amazing, quick adjustment. She was on her show talking about how she doesn't have clothes that fit her. She needs to buy new jeans. And the craziest line in all of that is when she said, I dropped weight because I've been listening to my doctor. Whoa. To me, that's like she refuted the, the body image, the body positivity movement with just that sentence, in my opinion. Because the, the whole, like thesis statement of the body positivity movement is to just accept yourself at all weights and you know people who shame you for gaining weight or being unhealthy are just trying to make you feel bad you can be any size you want and when she said because I listened to my doctor it's like oh damn so she's saying everyone should listen to their doctor and have a drastic weight loss I just don't like how I was I used to be very plus size myself I used to weigh 50 pounds more than I do right now. And it was definitely just fat, which is fine. I liked myself then. I wasn't ashamed. Don't mind seeing it now. Love myself then. I think there's a lot of fun parts about being on the more plus size side. I don't think it's a terrible thing at all. But when I lost weight, I definitely felt a responsibility to my like just to to other people who have struggled with weight before to tell the fellow fatties like what I did because I feel so connected to people who have been fatter before 
and I feel a sense of community with them. So I would just, out of respect and responsibility, I would tell people if I was on Ozempic. And Kelly Clarkson should have a lot of empathy for that because she used to be plus size and it would be a big topic of discussion in the media. She would always have to, unfortunately, talk about her body and her body image and stuff. So she knew a lot of her fans probably saw themselves in her and thought she was a great role model. And now she lost weight and she's not even telling them how she did it. And it's going to give people bad complexes and be like, wow, she lost 60 pounds in only six months and I can't do it just because she was walking around a sauna suit. Jeez, I must be so incompetent or incapable. It's just a self-efficacy issue and you don't want to set a unrealistic precedent for how much the average person should be able to lose without the secretion of hormones into your stomach via Ozempic. I hope Kelly will say something because Oprah did say something. She came through and said, yes, she's taking a weight loss drug s similar to those like Ozempic. She's not exactly on Ozempic, that brand, but the key ingredient, semaglutide, is what she's injecting into herself that's suppressing her hormones. By the way, I didn't know she was turning 70 this year. Gee, she looks amazing. But yeah, she really thinned out. She's very, very, very thin now, you know, still looks full and healthy, but super thin. And of course, Oprah, you know, a part of her whole life has been Weight Watchers and I love bread and that whole discussion. And she went about it in such the perfect way. She was like, yes, I love Ozempic. This is what she said. The fact that there's a medically approved prescription for managing weight and staying healthier in my lifetime feels like relief, like redemption, like a gift and not something to hide behind and once again be ridiculed for. I'm absolutely done with shaming from other people and particularly myself. She's going to use Ozempic as basically a tool to manage her weight and stop her from yo-yoing. Yeah, sounds legit to me. And Ozempic does sound like a nice, almost like safety net for people who do really struggle with their appetite. There's definitely a genetic component that plays into someone's appetite that I for sure have. My appetite is insatiable. I'm literally Debbie Ryan from Insatiable, Fatty Patty, as they would call her in that show. That is so me. So I think it is a good suit for people who really have big fluctuations in their weight and teeter to an unhealthy range like Oprah's saying. But the most crucial aspect is that Oprah told everyone because she knows her following. She knows what messaging she's going to be sending out by quickly dropping a bunch of weight. So I think she's very respectable and that's the way to go about it. And Oprah's a slay. Dr. Terry Dubrow from Botched. I'm sure you guys have seen Botched before. I love Botched. He said, Oprah is going to save people's lives by being honest with the fact that she's on Ozempic because he thinks Ozempic is a beautiful thing and it's going to be one of the most important thing things Oprah has ever done by letting the world know this is how she lost weight so other people who are in an unhealthy range can get their weight down and maybe dodge having any complications or anything like that. And if Dr. Terry Dubrow is saying it, maybe Ozempic isn't this bad thing that everyone was saying it wasn't first, in, including me. And I am I think I just was saying it was bad because people like Kim Kardashian are very thin people who don't need a medical intervention to just use this tool to their benefit and push some unhealthy range of skinniness on to everyone. I don't think that is good either. Something crazy, well, someone else who's definitely on something of the matter is Christina Aguilera. She looks amazing. I'm like, good for you, Christina. She lost probably 50 pounds this year from it. Her comment section says things like, Ozempic really came through and saved the girls. That's Christina Kardashian. That's Ozempic Aguilera. She looks super, super, super thin. Like she could do a sequel to Burlesque right now or something. Sharon Osbourne said she lost 40 pounds in four months from Ozempic. If you get rid of all the Ozempic, then who's going to clean your toilets? Donald Trump. In the sense that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just think it's very interesting that like everyone 
is on it, but not being very open about it. Now, Lizzo, in Lizzo's comment section, people think she is lo losing the weight now. She's in the process of doing that. Is she on something like that? Is she not? People are definitely doing think pieces about it if Lizzo is doing that. But again, like that's her right for sure to do things like that. I guess what I think about all these stars who maybe were on board for the body positivity movement, maybe not the biggest advocates or leading the crusade, but on board for it. They're kind of like, it's kind of just interesting to me that right when Ozempic becomes a thing, they take the opportunity to no longer be plus sized or take the easy way out immediately once it's available to them as if being plus sized before was just out of um, like ob like obligation or the, the lack of being able to escape that. And that's where their passion for saying it's okay that I'm like this came from. And just because someone like Kelly Clarkson loses weight, it doesn't mean that they are completely abandoning the body positive movement, but it does mean that they won't be able to vouch or advocate for it. Or I just don't see them doing that in the future. Something else that happened a year ago today about like the body positive movement and all that a year ago today, Taylor Swift released the anti-hero music video, and this pissed me off so much because there was that scene of her stepping on the scale, the sensitive, real version of Taylor Swift stepped on the scale while her evil, hypercritical alter ego looked over her shoulder and made the scale just say fat, as if to say Taylor was ashamed that maybe she gained some weight or she's hard on herself if she puts on a few pounds, fat phobic, blah, blah, blah. The song is about self-loathing. So it's about hating yourself. And people thought Taylor Swift was saying, I hate myself because I've gained some weight. A lot of the body positive crusaders were quick to jump on her. How dare you insult plus size people like that? How dare you create this stigma? They were very upset. Very, very, very mad. But to me, their mindset was very one-sided, very selfish, and almost super dismissive to like a real struggle that everyone goes through in this day and age. And we do live in an interesting time where we are in the body positive movement of it all. But we were all still alive at a time when it was very normal for people to constantly shame you for your weight, constantly make these small jabs saying that you look too fat or don't gain weight or everyone being fat phobic. So that's drilled into our mind. That's half of the affirmation that we get. The other half of affirmation we get is people telling us, no, you're perfect at any weight. Don't look at the scale. Just soothe yourself and self-love. Look however you want to be plus size. Who cares? So it's these two different mindsets that meet in the middle of like, oh, my God, I feel bad for gaining weight, but I also feel bad that I feel bad that I gained weight. And that's what Taylor Swift was trying to say. She hates herself that she feels bad that she gained weight, but she does feel bad. And I just think that really just shows the complexity of the body positivity movement. And I feel like we should all apologize to her because she was just being real about her insecurities and the fact that it triggered your very specific movement that you were trying to push and it didn't align with your thoughts. So you just attack her. I think that's fucked up. So I'm sorry, Taylor, that they did that. But yeah, it's going to be interesting to see where the body positivity movement goes in 2024. I'm on a slight diet right now, so we'll see how it goes. Oh, my God. I finally have my appointment with my back doctor tomorrow for my bulged disc. I went to the chiropractor, too. Everyone is like, chiropractor is a scam and pseudoscience. Don't do it. It's not going to help you at all. My chiropractor helped me so much. Whatever she did, the way she laid on me and just cracked my shit, it helped so much. I love her. And she... Chiropractors are legit doctors. She looked at my MRI and she told me that I actually have another bulge disc that I didn't, I guess I didn't know about. So I have like double the bulge disc. So that fucking sucks. And my L4 and L5 vertebrae, pissed. Not the type of bulges that I would like. But yeah, I'm going to the back doctor and hopefully they'll tell me what to do. Working out feels much better, though. I feel so much better about the whole thing. So I can, like, move and bend forward again and not feel like I'm going to die. But, damn, these things take a long time to heal. But, yeah, 
I was like stunned for so long. I could really not move a lot and it was making me so pissed. It made me gain all this weight and be depressed because I couldn't move and would just lay there and I wouldn't even go get the food. I would just Uber eats the food to myself. Horrible, horrible combination. I'm very thankful to be up and at them again. Okay, so I want to end the episode today with talking about a conspiracy theory that I love. So this conspiracy theory that we're going to get into is the concept that celebrities get mentally stuck at the age they got famous. There's this whole concept and this whole theory that something happens to a celebrity's psyche where they get forever trapped and are unable to develop past the age in which they first experienced life-changing fame. Not just a little fame. Their whole life has to change and it will do something to their to their psyche where they it, it stops them from developing uh, like at a normal rate of life as maybe someone who just always has the same level of, you know, no fame at all. Like we all do in our lives, like we're able to develop on the same track and not have anything really change and throw us for a loop. Something about becoming so famous throws these celebrities for a loop. And what really inspired this was two things. The first thing that inspired this was Taylor Swift in her documentary, Miss Americana, that she put out a few years ago, where at the end of the documentary, she says, and I quote, there's this thing people say about celebrities, that they're frozen at the age they got famous. I had a lot of growing up to do, just trying to catch up to the age of 29. And I was like, whoa, she's so right. Because Taylor Swift does have that spirit of a teenage girl still. Like, she has that spirit of the teenage girl who's looking around for approval, looking to be homecoming queen or Miss America. The documentary was called Miss Americana. She clearly still has that psyche of just yearning for approval from maybe her elders or the more respected people around her. She wants to, it, it almost feels like she's stuck in that mindset of wanting to achieve something and wanting to get to the place where she saw her higher ups at and get to sit with them and be at the big kids table. But she doesn't understand she is the highest of the upper echelon. Like she is Taylor Swift, but in her mind, she's still this pathological people pleaser, pleaser teenage girl type. In the documentary, she was talking about how her whole moral code of life was, I want to be seen as a good girl who gets a pat on the back for when she is a nice, polite, agreeable young woman. And I do think she was trapped at that for a long time. Another example of this is, which is going to open so many people's eyes and make so much sense to this phenomenon that Leonardo DiCaprio, as you know, he has the reputation for only dating women who are 25 or below. So as I turn 24 this year, this is my last chance to snag him. But <laughs> um, he got worldwide famous at the age of 22 and 23-ish because as those two movies that year were being put out that really catapulted him to world-renowned fame like the Titanic and Romeo and Juliet. I don't know what the other one was, but that must have almost like stunted him when it came to connections he has with other people and not to get to that age of ever wanting to settle down. And it just makes so much sense why he breaks up with people on their 25th birthday, <laughs> unfortunately. And I'm, I'm happy we finally have an explanation for this because I've never really heard an explanation for it in my whole life. Another example, I think, is Michael Jackson. He got famous at five years old because his family definitely forced him into this world and, you know, thrust him into it against his own will. So he got famous at like five years old. And maybe that would explain why he wanted to be around kids so much not to bring up all the rumors and allegations and not saying anything about anything but obviously he loved kids and loved to spend time with kids and maybe he just saw his childhood that was taken away from him or he still saw himself as like he saw a part of himself in them and wanted to like care for them like he wished he was as a kid and still doesn't let that go and he can't you know accept being this grown man and just spending time with grown people he's just hanging out with the kids. That would definitely make sense for me. 
something else that inspired this directly. Like this is where I had this idea this week. I was scrolling on Instagram reels and a video of Miranda Cosgrove comes up and she got famous at 10 years old. Keep this in mind. It's this video of her saying, I've never been drunk before. And Josh Peck is like, why haven't you been drunk before? And she goes, I don't know. I truly have no good reason. I've never even been buzzed. I've sipped things before, but like two sips. She also said she's never smoked anything. And that almost made my blood run cold. I was like, Miranda Cosgrove is so weird. She's well into her 30s. She's not the young iCarly girl anymore, but she's acting like this kid who just is curious about drinking but has never wanted to like take that step or grow into someone who <clears throat> drinks because it is seen as like a big moment in a young kid's life and like a rite of passage to like finally drink and blah 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 and the fact that she just said I've never had a good reason is so weird to me that's like saying I've never had a good reason to like dance with my friends or go to a party I guess you don't need a good reason to do anything but maybe just like live life I don't know but a part of me immediately thought, oh, my God, she's so mentally stuck at Nickelodeon. She so is. And she does only curse a little bit. <laughs> As we know, she sometimes says, fuck. So <laughs> Other examples, I think, could be Kendall and Kylie Jenner. They got famous at like nine and ten. You definitely don't have to develop much empathy or, or like sympathy for people in other situations in the world. Lots of affluenza going on, lots of insular vibes going on there. But when you can kind of just be in this childlike carefree stance your whole life, you don't really have to. Another example is Paris Hilton. She talks like a child all the time. She has this, what she calls her baby voice as if she wants to come off as this spring chicken all the time. Another example could be Britney Spears. Hers probably has a lot of factors to it, but even in her book, she says she feels like she was stuck in girlhood. And now this year she can finally try to move on and find the woman, the woman in her. That was the title of her book. And I think a part of that definitely has to do with her team controlling her life and her dad controlling her life. That would stop your self-development if you can't make any decisions of yourself and step into womanhood but I think it also has to do with the world just saw her as a teenage girl so she wants to act like this young sexy um adored over super tight and hip young girl and I think that's why she probably dances in thongs on her Instagram she wants to kind of solicit people's lust for her as if she is still that young, sexy girl. I mean, and she is very sexy and young, but you know what I'm saying? In that kind of realm. In the sense that... I think Justin Bieber is an example. He even said this in one of his documentaries. He was like, when you have immense fame and all this money, you can kind of do whatever you want with your life and act however you want. And he did that at 15. He also said performing for stadiums every night and having so many people lust and adore over him stunted his, like it releases some hormones in your mind and like stunts your growth. That may explain why he dresses the way he does and acts the way he does with Haley. Maybe that's why Haley's always seen like coddling him and taking care of him in a way as if she's a mother figure. She also wants to become his manager. So it seems like he's just like looking for someone to take care of him as if a child Obviously, another example could be Selena Gomez, famous at a very, very young age. And we know she definitely acts like a young girl sometimes with her, her middle school gossiping ways and the victim complex of it all. I think another important aspect of this, though, that plays into it, it's not just the celebrities forever trapped at the age they got famous and wanting to stay at that age because it's their peak and their glory. Also, the public plays a big role into it. And this made me open up to maybe I do this too and don't even realize it. The other side of this frozen in time thing that doesn't get talked about is that people freeze a celebrity at the point they first recognized them as famous. That benefits some celebrities who became famous in their 20s. It, on the flip side, really traps child and teenage stars 
where the audience can't let them go from where they first recognized them as famous and they can't really see them as adults. This definitely would play into the example of Miley Cyrus, who sometimes will act like, um, you know, her younger teenage self, but will also do drastic things to try to not be frozen at where she first got famous, the whole bangers era and the swinging naked on a wrecking ball. She almost like saw this conspiracy or this theory and tried to get ahead of it. Ooh, another example, which I love is the Mariah Carey example. She puts every year on her birthday, she puts 12 on her birthday cake because she says she's eternally 12 and does not want to grow up. Yeah, she got famous at 20, but I feel like she is yearning for the carefree feeling of being younger than 20 because of what fame did to her and what her family and ex-husband has done to her. So I think there's more to the joke of her just being like, I'm eternally 12. Kanye West is another example. In the song, No More Parties in LA, he calls himself a 38-year-old, eight-year-old. Well, he didn't get famous at eight years old, Kanye's personality always has come across as extremely boyish and mature. He has the grandiosity of a young man prior to their prefrontal cortex developing for sure. Um, Johnny Depp is an example. Someone on Reddit said, Johnny Depp, we were talking about the Pirates of the Caribbean ride at dinner because we are going to Disneyland next weekend. And my 11 year old mentioned that the old guy from the movies is so cringy, emo, and annoying. I was worried he watched something about the trial on YouTube, but no, he saw Johnny Depp's Dior ad and made his opinions that he never grew up past his Edward Scissorhands days, and it shows. He's a great actor, but he never evolved past his dark and brooding persona um, that he was banking on so much when he was younger. That's why he can't let go of things like Pirates of the Caribbean. That makes sense. I think Ariana Grande could be an example, too. I think people would say the ways in which she needs a relationship and is a relationship girl and cannot be single for more than five minutes is the keystone of someone who maybe be immature at a given moment. So I don't know. Maybe these celebrities are just living their lives and acting as you please, or they're stuck at the age of got famous. But yeah, that's the conspiracy theory of the week. I would love to do more conspiracy theories. So let me know in the comments which ones you want to hear more about. I'm a huge conspirator, so. All right, well, thank you guys for joining me this week on Pop Culture University. Um, make sure to like this video on YouTube. Subscribe, Spotify. I feel like we talked about so much. There was just so much to cover and just give my real opinion on even if it was harsh. So thank you for hanging out. Next week, we will do another amazing conspiracy theory, and I'm sure a lot will come in 2024. I feel like January is always a crazy fucking time in pop culture, but until then, I will love you all, and see you next week. Okay, bye. You just watched a clip from my podcast. Make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel and go to the full video here on YouTube or on Spotify to get the full tea, all the tea, and nothing but the tea as we do at Pop Culture University.